On June 18th at GatewayCon, Right Pack Radio will be making a live broadcast. This will be recorded and still available through TuneIn, iTunes, and YouTube after the broadcast. However, this will disrupt our normal distribution on Sunday. Join us for the live broadcast. We will tweet it out as well as put it on our Facebook page so that you too can join join us at GatewayCon. And thank you for listening. Writing is my favorite thing to do. Have you heard about the Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention? They'll have writing workshops, writing classes, and more. June 16th through 18th, 2017, at the Renaissance Airport Hotel in St. Louis, Missouri. Cool! Where can I sign up? Go right now to www.stlwritersguild.org and click on GatewayCon. www.stlwritersguild.org and click on GatewayCon? That's right. See you there. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, president of Winding Trails Media and president of Stainless Writers Guild, and currently writer of Crazy Things. And with me today, we've got a huge host, uh, people who are going to be talking, so hang tight with each of one of us. With me today is also now a fellow president. Yes, uh, this is uh, George Saroy. As of May 6, I am now the president of the Missouri Writers Guild. Uh, I'm also the uh, an author of science fiction for the young adult reader. My uh, two books, Excelsior and Ever Upward, uh, Part Two of the Excelsior Journey, are currently in preparation for launch through A Loris Publishing. I'm also a voice actor and audiobook narrator. You can get more information on that on the website he's got it dot com. Congrats. Thank you. Yes. Or being the president myself, I'll say, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and with that. Uh, my name is Jennifer Solzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. The last couple episodes I said that there was a contest running on my website. It's kind of a loose contest, but there is. <laughs> Uh, my uh, my fan YA fantasy book Threadcaster came out this spring, and there is a short story currently out for it to uh, as part of the Out of Darkness anthology. So, as we're working on short stories now, uh, if you read Threadcaster or you read the short story, which is significantly shorter, <laughs> and you leave a review for it on Amazon or on Goodreads, every name that has a review, a named review on it goes into a pool to become a named character in my next short story, which is called Wind Curse, and will hopefully come out in the middle of summer. Excellent. So that's www.threadcaster.com. You can get it for free as part of the anthology. Is but that uh, 2018 summer or? No, the short story is going to come out this summer. Oh, okay. 2017 summer. Now the sequel is going to be like 2019. <laughs> <laughs> it does take a while to write. Uh, yes, I am Brad R. Cook, uh, author of the steampunk trilogy The Iron Horseman. Uh, do check out uh, my latest short story, which uh, might be out by this recording, hopefully. Uh, Doomed Flight of the Majestic. You can find it online. It's diesel punk. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> I'm Melanie Lucas. I am currently working on a fantasy novel, and yes, I actually did work on it this week. Yes, Melanie's been having to juggle quite a lot, including dealing with me with the upcoming conference of Gateway Con, which I will talk about in a moment. And also with, Alet, with us is also a, another president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. Mm -hmm. I'm Fedora Amos. I write Victorian who done it like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis and Mayhem at Buffalo Bills Wild West, which just won a prize at the Missouri Writers Conference. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, if you'd like to see me in person, I am going along with John Frayne and Claire Applewhite going to do a presentation at Gateway Con, which is called I Love a Mystery. And you will too after you hear us. <laughs> Excellent. I feel like we have a summit. We do have <laughs> three presidents. We got three presidents. Yeah. We're set. I'm pretty we will sure solve world like, problems. Security or something. <laughs> <laughs> we'll solve the world's problems better than the world leaders. Okay. With us is also returning. My name is Rob Howell, and I am the author of the Fantasy World of uh, Shu Yuren, 
which you can find on Amazon. I didn't plan it this way, but it's been very serendipitous that I am the only Shiguren on Amazon. Mm -hmm. That's S-H-I-J-U-R-E-N. Um, I spelled it odd, and I got lucky that there's nothing on Amazon besides that. <laughs> I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, I am just released the third in my mystery series. It's fantasy mysteries, hard-boiled detective fantasy. Uh, the mean streets of Minas Tirith were foggy that evening, and I walked through to see that elf kind of story. Um, and the third of that series has just been released, and I'm very pleased with how that series is going. I have another series in that world. Uh, next week after this recording, I will be in Salina at Salina Comic Con, and then the week or two weeks after that, I will be at Liberty Con. So if you're at any of these cons, please come and see me and say hi. Thank you. Also with us, I'm Jody Feldman. I write uh, middle grade and young. I just started writing young adult um, works for kids. Mm -hmm. uh, my my most famous, I guess, book series is called The Golly Whopper Games through Harper Collins. And um, the YA, the, the middle grade are all boy books, uh, boy main characters. I am not a boy, just you can see that, but I'm not. And um, yeah, I'm a 12 year old boy somewhere inside me though. And they have a, an element of puzzles and a mystery to them too. Uh, my YA though, that I've just about finished with a writing partner is all girl. Mm -hmm. So a um, little bit of um, disconnect there, but it's all good. <laughs> We're all two faced. Yeah. It's yeah. okay. It's yeah. great, yeah. And we got to meet Jody via Jennifer when she covered the. Uh, the what was it called? Well, Fedora too. Fedora. Well, Fedora um, was running. It yeah. was the Wine, Wit, and Lit uh, yes. event. Absolutely, yeah. it was great. Yeah. Fun. It was wonderful. Fun. And also with us is. Hi, I'm uh, I'm Rebecca Jacox. I'm the author of the Inheritance series, um, with, like with George and with Iluris Publishing. In fact, this is our second small press together. Um, mm -hmm. George and I must really like each other. Or you, <laughs> I, or I you would trust hope so. me. Or you trust me. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, so I, I relaunched The Other Inheritance, which is my first book in March, and the sequel came out in April, The Other Queen, and I hope to get the third book of the trilogy out next April, uh, along with writing YA. This is fantasy, steampunk, and a little urban fantasy mixed, um, my YA series, and I'm also an editor, developmental editor, uh, copy, line, all of that good stuff, though I prefer developmental editing, um, it's my kind of strong suit, and George can tell you that about that because mm -hmm. I just took apart his novel. Oh, I got um, stories. <laughs> so, uh, you we know, heard about that before you came. I, I got, I, I, you know, uh, I huff and puff and blow your house down. Mm -hmm. So um, that's me in a nutshell. Well, speaking of, since you talked about editing, and that's not what we're going to talk about, everybody. But just real brief, if you go back in time to May twenty-one, I believe that's yeah. We just taught, we just had posted the um, episode on. Hiring an editor. So, as such, are you open for for editing? And if so, what website do they contact you? Um, I am open for editing, and actually, it's easier to uh, contact me on my Facebook page. It's called uh, Rebecca Jaycox Slayer of Adverbs. <laughs> so, um, you can contact me there. You can also email me at Rebecca Jaycox Author at Gmail .com. I am definitely willing to slay your adverbs for you. Mm -hmm. So, how do you spell your last name? J A Y C O X. Excellent. Thank you. No problem. Now, today we are still talking about editors a little bit, but not just editors. We're going to talk about comments and criticisms. How do we respond to them? Be them comments and criticisms from editors, comments and criticisms from our beta readers, our um, critique groups, our buddies, our parents. Well, if you have parents <laughs> like mine, they're like, you're writing? Why? Mm -hmm. um, or you might get more likely, if it's on Amazon, Either people who have read your book and maybe liked it, didn't like it, or a guy or a girl who didn't bother to read it and has ultimately criticized it anyway. So, and by the way, I just I had named Amazon, but those comments can be anywhere: Goodreads, Facebook, etc. So, I'm going to open up the floor with how do you respond to good comments or bad comments? Well, the first thing uh, you do is when, uh, when, if you have the opportunity to reply to a comment, do not. <laughs> um, please, do not, because all you're doing is you're opening the door for a very unprofessional looking back and forth between you and the commenter. Right. Um, and if, uh, if you're on Goodreads and that happens, then 
God help you, because not only does uh, not only does that open up the door for the same unprofessional back and forth, but it also opens the door for more people to go ahead and gang up on you and make you look even worse than you are. So um, take that opportunity and do not respond to any reviews on Amazon or Goodreads. And I, just to clarify, and you did it at the end, but to make sure we're clarified on that. You're talking about the general comments coming from, are you talking about comments coming from the general public? I'm t- not yeah. from your ed- editor who's having to sit next to you. If you, if you are, yeah. <laughs> here's, the thing, here's the thing though, this is, this is the main thing. What, what the editor is giving you is what has not gone out to the general public yet. So you have the opportunity to have a little back and forth and address those comments and go ahead and fix them. When it's out in the general public, it's out there. That's pretty much set in stone, even though, you know, like you can always kind of, this day and age, you can go back and fix sure. it, you know, later on. But you don't want to keep thinking that way. And this is this is coming from the person who's having his third edition of Excelsior about to come out. So uh, with, you know, like with multiple changes and, you know, throughout each edition. But at the same time, do not, don't do that. You know, just don't reply to comments. Work with, work with your, your feedback, you know, with the people that are, that are providing it before it comes out. Jen, you're next. Uh, I want to, like, make a sort of a a, a branch off of that. Okay. We're in the day and age, especially as independent publishers, you know, if we're in publishing our own, but uh, that extends to people being published through houses. We don't have press people that are on payroll for us. We have to do all of our own marketing. And the way that the modern day does marketing is through, uh, through reader interaction. Like we want, we are we are told we're supposed to interact with our readership, and let them know that we're a human too, and that we value their input, and let them feel like they can touch the thing that they love. Uh, when you get comments from people who are your fans, uh, you know, if they give you bad feedback or angry feedback, yes, do not get angry back at them. Uh, you can thank them if you want to, you know, on Twitter. Hey, thanks for reading it. Thumbs up something nice. If you feel you must, but try not to. Um, any comments that you get back and forth, I, I just wanted to make a note and say remember that you are a professional, you are a professional persona. Even if me as a person wants to make a snarky comment back, I have to stop and think and say, no, this I'm wearing professional gen hat, and professional gen hat doesn't need to risk someone misunderstanding what I'm saying. So. It's good to engage with your audience, run contests, uh, reblog, you know, comments back to you, and uh, reply with nice things that are, you know, if you're having fun with somebody, if it's someone that you know all right already that you want to joke back and forth with, just be mindful of who you are when you're, when you're operating under your writer head. And be mindful that if you're joking back and forth like that with somebody you know, everybody can see that. Mm-hmm. So, Brad and... Oh. Just to throw it out there, this has cost people their careers. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, and not even just the author. I mean, there have been the author's people have gone after the commenters before and mm-hmm. caused all kinds of problems. Uh, famously, an agent jumped over one, and that led mm-hmm. to weeks and weeks and weeks of all kinds of craziness. So, yeah, keep it professional. And then also, remember, too, if you are with your editor, uh, no one wants to be labeled troublemaker. No one wants to be labeled hard to work with, which is the lovely term that gets thrown around by everybody here in this industry. <laughs> mm. uh, and if you're hard to work with, uh, you know, some agents, editors, and stuff like that may not want to pick you up. So Speaking of this, losing careers, uh, don't remember the university, but I saw an article happen really recently about a university professor got suspended on her way to being fired for writing uh, bad Yelp reviews. Mm. So this wasn't strictly about uh, author reviews, but same type of thing. I want to actually follow up on, on what both Jennifer and George said. I, I actually am more in Jennifer's camp than with George. I agree with, the, the, the most important thing is, is that we are professionals. We need to treat these things as professionals. And every response we make online needs to be professional, whether or not it's in uh, a professional area because I could say something on my personal account uh, and if I were to say something uh, whimsical that's fine but if I say something that 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 toes certain you know boundaries then I I can cost myself readership but I do think it's 
there's a difference between a bad review that says, well, he, he so and so, Rob really sucks at too many strange words and <laughs> too many, you know, weird, you know, he's too complex and, and well, okay, fine, that's a legitimate complaint. And if you don't like that, don't like my book because of that, great. I'll respond to that. I'll say, thanks for reading. I, I realize it's something I, I, I struggle with and I will try to do better in the future. I will give the, that legitimate review, especially bad ones, um, a, a polite professional response that does engage the reader. If somebody says, um, Rob's a jerk, well, they may know me and I may very well be a jerk. <laughs> But I also, I won't engage with the troll, and I think there's a difference there. A bad review is someone who I want to at least engage with them professionally. A troll, you're absolutely right. You step into the troll's trap and you're That's done. That's the adage, don't feed don't the trolls. Mm -hmm. to, to jump on top of that, I, I tend to use constructive um, criticism to improve my writing. Mm -hmm. I don't just take it as a, as a blow to the heart. Um, when, if someone tells me something, if more than one person will tell me the same thing, it's like, I may have a problem. But I did get a review once. I have a book called The Seventh Level where one of the characters calls another one an oaf quite liberally. Mm -hmm. And I, the entire review, and this was a professional mag, literary magazine review, said the whole the whole criticism was that she didn't like the word oaf. <laughs> and I, it was outdated. It was not right, proper for kids to read. And so I, next time I was at a school visit, I went to the kids and I said, who has heard the word oaf? And they said, yeah. I said, has anybody ever used it? And they said, yeah. It's like, okay, I just, I needed to prove her wrong for my sake. But the main point <laughs> was that I take the criticism, the parts that the characters aren't deep enough that I want to know more about what their motivation is to move my writing forward. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to sort of diverge. I'm going to agree with George about, I don't actually think you should engage any kind of criticism, and this is why, and I think you can do it in a professional way, but, you know, sarcasm and whatever doesn't translate on the internet. So right. somebody Absolutely. can take yeah. anything wrong no matter what you say. <laughs> so to me, it's just not worth it for me to say, even if it's constructive, to be like, oh, I appreciate that, and they might be like, oh, you appreciate that, you know, and I'd be like, no, I mean, I really do. Um, and there, there are two kinds of reviews, and I pay attention to three-star reviews because normally when somebody takes the time to write a three-star review out, they have something to say that's mm -hmm. worth listening. I've had two two-star review rants on my first book, and I mean like five paragraphs. Wow. One was about sexual content in my first book that never happened. Huh. So I sat there, and I was incredibly confused how this woman, and it's for uh, readers for 15 and up, mm -hmm. by the way. She went on and on about this very elaborate sex scene, and there is no elaborate sex scene. So I was very, you know, and of course I wanted to be like, lady, are you insane? Mm -hmm. Nothing is happening in this book. But for me, I think things get lost in translation, even when you are being polite and professional. And I just still think it's kind of dangerous um, and should always be professional online. But I agree with you that I do take those three-star reviews and be like, okay, you had a good point. You know, some mm -hmm. of them don't, but <laughs> some of them do. Yeah. I think everyone is doing a fine job of telling what not to do. Well, I'd like to suggest something that you can do. And it's taking a leaf from the book of Abraham Lincoln, who's a pretty good authority on a lot of things. He's gotten a lot of bad reviews by certain people. <laughs> yeah, that's true enough. Well, There's that one by Jefferson Davis. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That was where my mind was going. His Secretary like of War, war. Yeah. was a fellow named uh, Edwin Stanton. And he was a fiery, feisty little guy mm -hmm. who at one point was just absolutely apoplectic because one of his subordinates had disobeyed an order and he ranted and raved and said he had a mind to write him a stern reprimand right that very moment and Abraham Lincoln surprised everyone because he was always cool <laughs> but he said go ahead do it do it right now cut him all up and so Stanton wrote this scurrilous reprimand just practically set the page on fire. Mm -hmm. And he asked Lincoln where to send it. And Lincoln said, send it. Why don't send it? <laughs> <laughs> you got the thing off your mind. That's the important thing. Mm -hmm. Don't send it and make an enemy for life. I never do. I'm going to dovetail in there and get turns over to Brad. And speaking of that, Brad and I have had this conversation a couple of times. You know, we find ourselves typing something similar Exactly, a, a, rave, a 
response back to this person. Personally, I type it on Microsoft Word and sit there and type it and hit delete. Mm -hmm. That way it's not even a chance I accidentally hit the right wrong button. Or file it in a trash file. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do so, and then yes. maybe someday later on when you're a big, big success, you could look at it and say, Oh yeah? I want to get hacked so it all comes out. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, so um, to kind of go in, we're now, to clarify, we're not talking about audience engagement here. We're talking about criticism. So, Correct. You know, engage with your audience on all kinds of levels and do all that kind of stuff. But yeah, probably leave the criticism, you know, aside. Uh, and don't take it to personally because you don't know why they're ripping into you. It could mm -hmm. be they're just having a bad day. Or they could uh, have posted that for the wrong book. <laughs> it could be. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, but flipping this back over to the editors, I would say that when you're reading an editor's comments... Uh, you know, your first inclination is going to be, uh, that's not the way I wanted it, or some variation of that. And to know that, you know, you and your editor and your publisher and everybody else who are involved in this book, uh, the entire goal of editing and having this team behind you is to make the book as good as possible when you put it forward. So keeping that in mind, just remember that your editor is your friend. They may not like them, them, but they are your friend. <laughs> I want to actually comment that on that as being on both sides of the coin, having to read my editor's remarks and then being an editor myself. And I had a client who, she asked me to do um, developmental edits, so I did. And every suggestion that I made, because it needed to be fleshed out, she wrote back, oh my god, like two um, word sheets, word pages with points on why she did it that way. And which was frustrating because I was like, "Why hire me if you don't if you don't want me to tell you? You can't leave things exactly the way they are because there are problems with it, and the things that you're describing of why they are aren't happening in the book. So I wouldn't know that, mm -hmm. and that means that you need to put them in um, if you're understanding the problems. And as an Ed George may or may not disagree with me, um, <laughs> when I go through even when I do developmental edits, I'm not trying to rewrite your story for you. I'm not rewriting sections and telling you to put this in. I'm Thank just you. suggesting about, oh, that's not my job. That's not my job to write your story for you. It's mm -hmm. my job to go in, it's like building a house and trying to see if your foundation is solid. And if it's not solid, I go in and point out where it's not solid and what doesn't make sense to me. And it's your job to fill in those, those gaps. And it's not my job to rewrite, and that's not what I do. But I just thought that was interesting to hire somebody and then say, point by point, why? But, but then put it in your book. So that's my frustration as an editor because it makes it difficult for me to work with you. Now I'm going to say real something real fast, and then I want to come back after both George and Rob. I'm going to say real something real fast. That's a great uh, metaphor of what an editor is, especially a developmental editor. Think of them as a home inspector. Mm -hmm. They're coming in, oh, you got termites in chapter four here. It's not <laughs> going together. You put a little more weight there, it's going to collapse, et cetera. Great way to put it. I've I've said this to Rebecca before, and I've also and I've also said this on an earlier episode of Right Back Radio, which is probably the one you're listening you're listening to today. Um, you know, so, on this particular on the day that it came out. Um, but uh, <laughs> reminder, we, not to we, get the we report for the future. So, yeah, yeah. It just blew everyone's mind. I know. <laughs> I just I just completely yeah. I know. <laughs> Up is down. Black is white. I know. <laughs> But uh, but I I have uh, I have basically you know said to Rebecca that she is my sledgehammer for Excel for Excelsior because what she did was she took one last good whack at this at this story that had been out before in two different iterations and showed me where there are still cracks and it is it has been just a, you know at first obviously when you when you look at it. You're looking through your manuscript. You see a lot of red. You know, like, you know, it is a bl it is a blow to the ego. You just have to get through that mm -hmm. and figure out, like, okay, what is it? What is it that uh, that I need to do to address these problems? And once you start to address them, then all of a sudden you get to see that you know, like, yes, they had the right idea when they were putting all these different comments and suggestions in, because I am. Almost halfway finished with the, at this at this point. Hopefully, by the time you hear this, I'll be finished. <laughs> if if I, if it's not if it's not finished, then something's really wrong. Um, but um, I am really really happy with the way that this story has has really been told now, and um, and also just uh, really quickly with uh, when uh, 
when you talk about uh, Fedora, when you were talking about taking the um, taking your notes and get it, and deleting them, taking your replies and deleting them. What I would actually also suggest is to basically like you know jot down any constructive criticism, yes. keep them in a separate Word document so that if you have an opportunity to go back and redo this particular story or if there are constant problems with your story that you can kind of go in and fix for like a later story, then you have those notes to hold on to. Jody and then Jen. Just dovetailing on what George said about um, getting those notes and having, it's like you get hit with a sledgehammer, like your guts fall out. If it's, if it's somebody who you ask to edit you, because the first time I got edits, um, I, I went into a total panic so much that I had two months worth of hives. Really? I had never have had hives in my life before. I had never had hives in my life after. <laughs> and um, it was just a matter of thinking that this is for real. I have to do this. I have to do everything they say, and, but you don't. You have to almost like triage mm -hmm. the comments that your editor gives you to see which are most important, and at least this is what I found, and which may not make a difference in your work. And so what I tend to do is um, I get panicky, and then I take a breath, and I realize that the editor has, everything the editor says might not be important to what I'm doing in the book, but I need to take everything into consideration because there was some thought behind it, and I have needed to consider why that comment that I'm not using, why they made that, mm. and why I shouldn't use it. Mm -hmm. I mean, both for dovetailing, and actually I got three, so Jen, Ron, uh, me? No. Okay. Um, first off, I'll praise okay. Jody okay. saying what, uh, like a big thing of what I ha I've had to learn that, that um, every comment made is coming from someone noticing something. Mm -hmm. And it's more important to notice what they're noticing mm -hmm. than it is to take what they told you word for word. And sometimes what they told you word for word is great, but uh, oftentimes, and I'm gonna say most of the time, you shouldn't go with the suggestion that is given to you just point blank. You either have to look, you have to look at it and make it your own edit and apply it to everything your brain knows about your story because no one knows it as well as you do. Right. So that's good. The thing I wanted to say toward George's point, okay. really, really briefly, uh, uh, my advice to myself and the lesson I learned about receiving edits even from critique partners that I asked and, and editors that I've paid, um, you're, you, you will always feel that ego hit because you want your thing to be good. Uh -huh. And it's not bad because you've got edits on it, but it can, everything can always be better. Every human being in the entire world can always improve themselves. You know, that's, that's the reason for life, is to keep learning and changing. But um, you, have, you will have all of those, those uppercuts and punchbacks that you want to make. Uh, go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great, great point. Yeah, go, yeah, don't reply to whomever until the next day or a handful of hours or that thing that you were getting ready to do. It's like, don't, don't reply in that moment where you have an emotional reaction. Reply later out of a brain reaction when you've had time to process, and sleep is fantastic for that. Mm -hmm. Sleep has solved a lot of arguments that I could have gotten into before I got into them. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, punching bags. Yeah. Several points, because you guys have touched on a, a lot of great stuff. Uh, follow up on, on your point about um, not taking everything from the editor. I, there are a few things that my editor has pointed out that I have thought really hard, gone to sleep about, <laughs> taking showers, where I do a lot of thinking, <laughs> driven around a bit, and gone, no, I'm going to go ahead and go with it because it matches what I want. Most of the things she says, what I'll do is, it, uh, I'm not talking about simple punctuation things, of course we take all of those immediately and accept <laughs> them, but I'm talking about most of the time when she says something about my sentences, uh, I have a bad habit of writing in Robbie's. It's something that is perfectly comprehensible <laughs> to me and only me. And so most of the time when she points out a sentence, I'm not actually looking at her specific criticism. I'm looking at this entire paragraph is miswritten and needs to be improved. So I have to rewrite the entire paragraph because it's not saying what I want it to, to say. And her specific criticism only highlights the fact that it's not communicating mm -hmm. the energy or the point of view or the action or the beat uh, that it needs to. And I'm employing an editor, she, she actually serves both the copy editor and, and, and sort of your developmental 
function, one of the things she especially is useful to me in our first round of edits, because I go through two full rounds of edits with her every time, the first round especially, she is telling me when the story sucks. <laughs> because the first draft, there's always points in the story where it, it needs to be punched up. Absolutely. Or yeah. this character isn't showing the, the kind of emotion you want the character to show. Or, or it's, it's, you, you, you hammer in a joke or something and, and the editor goes, yes, yes, I got it four paragraphs ago. <laughs> you know, these kinds of things that, that are there. And you're paying the editor to help you craft something. The first 100,000 words I type in a novel is pulling the clay out of the ground. The next month, month and a half, is me shaping that clay. Mm -hmm. And an editor is merely one of the tools yep. that I use to shape that clay. And if you ignore the tool, you have wasted your money on the editor and you've put out sub optimal product. Yes, yeah, but you can let your ego step in front of you. Mm -hmm. you kind of related well, it relates to everything you're talking about with that, too, is the editor, you have to keep in mind, though, who the editor is and what their expertise is, mm -hmm. because all this is assuming you have the right editor for you. Yes. I took a couple of fiction writing classes in college. They were workshop classes, great classes to take. By the way, your experience depends very much on what group of people you happen to get. Mm -hmm. They're all taught by grad students. Mm -hmm. But um, first class, wrote a story, got critiques on it. Second class, with permission, turned in the same story with a big rewrite, got comments on it. Thing is, I got opposite comments mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. I took a appraisal of who was in the class and decided, hmm, this story is the main character is a mother of a six-year-old little girl. Let's see, who's in this class now? Let's see, the teacher is a tw in 20s male. Half the class is male. You know, maybe it's not my intended audience mm -hmm. for this story. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. I took a class with Media Bistro, because um, when I was living in, well, I still live in New York, but I was the only YA writer. And my instructor who wrote, she was published, I also think through HarperCollins, but she wrote um, women's uh, commercial fiction because they don't call it chick lit anymore. I think it's <laughs> and she kept telling me I couldn't do this in YA when she critiqued me. And I kept telling her, you can do this in YA. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, this is not going to work out because she had no idea what YA was or YA fantasy. And mm -hmm. she was like, this is violent. And I said, have you read The Hunger Games? <laughs> I don't like, understand um, and what you're saying. But to also talk about, you know, you don't have to take every comment your editor says. Sometimes you, you know, it's your story and you know it best. So I, I understand that. I've also had people... Um, I'm actually the editor for Iris Publishing, so I do everybody. But I've had people who have written stories, you know, independently, and then go with the publisher, and they don't want to change anything, even though there's something wrong, because they said, "Well, we're a fan base." But I don't believe in putting out a subpar product just because it's already been out. Mm -hmm. To me, that sort of goes against everything you're trying to do, because you just said, as a writer, at least for me, my second book's better than my first book, thank God. <laughs> and all I and I hope my third is better. And I'm just trying to learn and make you know, better things. And I do listen to my editor and we do speak and have a good relationship, but I don't understand um, hiring an editor and you have to find the right fit for you. You right. know, it's, it's like Cinderella, you gotta find the, the shoe that fits. Um, but I don't understand that. I think that even if it has been out and has a group, I mean, Excelsior has been out, but it's not, George was like, not, how dare you make good suggestions on my novel? I can't believe you would wanna change anything. Um, I, don't, I think that everything should be as, as good as you can get it. You know, it's, it's our job as writers and professionals to put a quality product out. So, so my thing, <clears throat> I completely agree. My thing is, your name is on the book. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my name, uh, sorry, my book's sitting right there, so I'm just kind of staring <laughs> as George said that. Staring oh, yes. at a copy uh, of yeah. my name. My name is on that book. <laughs> I was like, yes. yeah, my name is on that book, actually. But no, <laughs> so yeah, my name is on that book, and... Uh, Oddly, that's the book I'm going to talk about. So, you know, we don't okay. have a video no, camera. No, 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 no. <laughs> so you can see the Vanna White. Um, actually there. <laughs> but yeah, so um, when I was in publishing, though, when I worked for a publisher, uh, I also had the belief that my name was on that book. Mm -hmm. My publishing company's name was on that book. Um, and so everything that I, I put out, uh, I, I really do believe in that. Um, Iron Zulu, I ran into the, the, the issue of an editor that is not necessarily working for you. And this is why I think it is wonderful that we have all had the comment here to 
Uh, take the edits that you want and the ones that you think work best for you and you don't have to accept them all. These are incredibly important things to learn. Sometimes you have to fight for the soul of your book. Sometimes you have to fight to ensure that what you turned in is what you want. And I'm not talking about not changing anything. Mm -hmm. The entire ending of that book is different than uh, what it originally started out as. However, what I mean is, is that there are things that you set out to do in a book. There's, there's you know, a genre, a character, um, a theme, these kinds of things. And if your editor doesn't get that, if they can't see it, if they're not familiar with your genre, um, if they're not familiar with what you're doing, uh, this can lead to a whole series of issues and really you, and to be honest, this is the advice I got from uh, literary agents and oddly enough, HarperCollins uh, is just popping up here today. So uh, one of the big publishers at HarperCollins is that uh, your name is on that book, mm -hmm. no one else's. Mm -hmm. When somebody stares at that book, they don't see the publisher's name first, they see your name first. And because of that, every word in there is going to be attributed to you. Right. And you need to make certain that what is being said is what you wanted to convey and not something that somebody else is trying to fit into your book, which is why I love that you said that you don't rewrite other people's work. Never. You're just editing it. Because that's the beauty part of editing. When that happens, that's wonderful. Anything else can be a nightmare. I'm not doing your job for you. It's not, it's not my job. It's just great. Just real quick, and then I'm going to turn over to Rob. Is one of the things, and this is something which I've done, and probably everybody in this room has done, is you build up a community around yourself mm -hmm. of people who know your themes, know know what you're aiming for, and so forth. Sometimes when you get to the level that Brad was talking about, you may have a editor on one book and a B editor on mm -hmm. the next one who's never read the first book and doesn't have a clue. And what you're going for. <laughs> and Jody, I, I see you got the horse for you. Um, it's never fun. Yeah, and yeah. That you run into that. But that's one of the important things where it's, yeah, where it's important if, you even, if you're not even at that level, you're spending a lot of time, you need to develop people around you to help develop it, and you need to listen mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. And if it's somebody who is way off base, thank them for our time, move on, find someone else to fill that hole. Actually, Dave, on that, I think that there is a, and it's actually a good thing to have a different editor if they also understand your right. point of view because every book has to stand on its own mm -hmm. and it, it cannot rely upon what an earlier book in the series did. You have to make these characters new again with each book. Agreed. Well, that's true, totally. but you can't change their physical descriptions and their ages and their names either. <laughs> or their ultimate behavior. Well, Consistency. Yeah. 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 So, so right. to follow up on what, and then I've got another point I want to get to, but to follow up on the, what you just said, I look at my editors, my, because I have multiple, um, my, I'm lucky that my mom is a professional editor, so I get that <laughs> for free, mm -hmm. but I have, uh, she doesn't actually understand fantasy novels, but she can do a lot of the grammar stuff, and that always mm -hmm. helps, but I've built for me what I call a racing team. It's very much like a NASCAR racing team in that I'm the driver. I'm the one who ultimately succeeds, uh, wins or loses the race. But I can't win a race without a good mechanic. I can't win the race without a good you know, pit crew to be there to take the tires off at a fast, you know. And so the editors, the alpha readers, my artists, my map guy, my... Uh, the people that I just talked to philosophically, you guys here as well with Right Pack Radio listening to your suggestions, other writers that I've been to, people who've helped me at cons, all of these people form my racing team and help me succeed or fail, uh, but it's me who uses them properly. Now, one of the, the ways I use editors that I think has really helped me a lot is that my editor and I have come up with a list of words that I use to dang off. <laughs> yes. yes. I have a list of words that my last pass before I send it to my editor is quite literally to go, how many times did I use shrug? Yep. How many did, times did I nod? How many times did I smile? Yep. How many times did I laugh? How many times did I shake my head? All of these things I go through and I clear out a bunch of them. I cleared out 2,000 words of them on my last one. I left a bunch of them in there. I left some in there. But what they are, what I use them as is to ensure that I'm, I, you as the reader knows who's speaking. Mm -hmm. If 
it's in a, if it's in a statement where he shrugged and then said this, well, I'll eliminate that. But if I go, this char character A says this, character B nods, character A says something, now I've kept the transition mm -hmm. and the characters are, I left those. But I only do that because my editor said, you used the, Rob, please stop <laughs> shrugging at everything. <laughs> All right. No, I love editors for that. My, I have a huge one with smiling. Uh, all my characters smile. It's my favorite reaction and everything. I don't know why. And then oddly enough, the word, and I've said this one many, many times, is erupted. Everything in my books erupts. I don't know why. Everything, you know, anger is erupting. And all this, I love erupting, and I use it way too much, and then I have to get rid of it a thousand times. And my editors are the ones who pointed out the smile one. I caught erupting myself. But, Brad, uh, you know. just admit to it, you are the Michael Bay of your book. <laughs> <laughs> Everything has to blow. There aren't that many explosions. Explosions. Go ahead and then over. I did, um, there, there, are two, there are two different uh, situations where, you know, like I did, you know, from editing and also from self-editing. The... Um, Rebecca has noted that, you know, like, yeah, my characters nod quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, it's basically kind of like the, uh, one of my favorite scenes in Johnny Dangerously where characters are nodding at each other for about, like, 15 seconds, <laughs> and Peter Boyle finally just goes, no more nodding! <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's basically, like, what, you know, what they, want, what they wind up being. Yes. So, you know, like, I've liked, I like to think that I've trimmed that down, you know, considerably. Um, back. Well, the, the other thing, the other thing, it turns out that uh, for the five-part serial from Parts Unknown that I'm almost finished with um, that for its for its relaunch, um, I tend to use. I turned out that I use the word then mm -hmm. very very li liberally. You know, like, you can't and, love you, but you do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and looking at looking at the um, going through the through the find uh, feature on Microsoft Word, and then just typing the word then and seeing over two hundred instances in a one hundred page story. <laughs> You gotta trim that down just a little bit. You just you you will be happy you did later on. Go ahead and then. Um, I also wanted to point out. Yes, I did do that with you. So okay. yes, but it's all luck. But it's all it, luck. it is um, luck. Yes. When, when you when you build your writing community, I um, and especially for writers who first start off. Um, sometimes they confuse your beta reader team with your editor. Mm -hmm. no, no, don't do that. Um, just because you have beta readers, and you should listen to them, and they have you because they're concerned about being entertained and content. It's not the same job, so they won't hire an editor. They just will just have betas do that, and I'm like, <gasps> yeah. Um, the second thing is, I do everything. I do uh, copy line, um, but I know people who hire editors who are just proofreaders. And that's it. And they don't understand the difference. Um, so they only are having, like, you have a tool drawer, like you said, and you're using one tool, but you're not using the rest. So I think it's important for writers, especially when they're first starting out, to understand that there are different levels of editing and to also understand that, like, beta readers, as much as we need them, aren't your editor. It's a different function. So, um, I mean, don't go in there thinking, oh, my best friend read it and two fans, and so that's it. Um, I think it's important. I mean, editing is important to have a polished product. Just to clarify, then I'm going to jump over to Rob and then Brad's next after that. And that is, in the writing industry nowadays, we really have two very strong markets. We have the traditional published, we have the indie published. Mm -hmm. And what she just said describes, may sound to you like she's talking about just strictly the indie published. No. Guess what? No. If no. you really want to get yourself traditionally published, you also need to go through those steps. Yes, your agent may be kind enough to do some editing. Yes, Harvard Collins might possibly have a little time to do a little editing. I'm purposely saying it that way because guess what? They're swamped. Mm -hmm. They're too busy doing other things, even if their name has an editor behind it. You have to make sure what you hand over to them is quality product. As Brad said earlier, it's your name on the product. Hire those editors. They're worth the money. Uh, sorry, could we just define beta readers just for people who are so great? I was about to do that. Go for it. Um, yeah, so um, first I was going to say the actual thing that scares me the most um, is when I've handed my stuff over to either critique partners or editors, uh, because my critique partners are very good, um, and they don't mark something. Like they'll go half a page without actually leaving a mark. Yeah. That scares me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, sure, I'll look back and I go, wow, I wrote that. But the, the first thought that runs through my head is, wait, 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 did you miss something? Because I'm not that good. Yeah. Um, you know, and so you kind of go through it. But 
Um, to, to get to Melanie's thing, the different types of editors, it is a good thing to kind of go to. So we started off with the beta readers. Beta readers are your friends, uh, anyone you know who's going to read your book. Um, and they are great, you know, your mom, your wife, your husband, your kids, maybe not. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the people you know who can give you valuable advice on your book. Either this book sucked or I really didn't like that part or this was the greatest thing ever. Um, usually you're going to get really positive feedback because these people are your friends. Next comes like critique groups. Uh, I actually am a big fan of these because these are other writers that you work with who go through your work with you and they are more likely to hard boil evaluate your work in front of you. They're gonna tell you the things that they think are wrong with it and it's an informed opinion. It's not an editor though, so don't just rely on your critique partners. Uh, then you'll hit like a developmental editor, which is um, an editor who reads through your stuff and it's essentially to say, you know, the beginning of this isn't working, let's restructure it here. Or the middle's not doing it for we got a little bit of a slag. Let's prop it up in the middle. They're going to tell you the things about your story that need work. Um, then you're going to hit a line editor, and a line editor is going to go line by line through your book and find all the punctuation mistakes, find the adverbs that need to go, find the dangling participles that, you know, are a problem, or the clipped sentences, or the... Actually, you wrote that sentence twice, so just chop these in half, smash them together, and you're good. Mm -hmm. um, that's more your line editor, and you're going to go through that. Yeah. You might run through a couple more editors, and then you're going to hit your proofreaders. Yeah. And yeah. your proofreader is literally the person who goes through your book the last time. Mm -hmm. And that is literally just to make certain that, like, I love that job when I was in publishing, because it was literally just finding, like, uh, where you hadn't actually put on or had gotten clipped out the uh, the quote of the, you know, the the end quote or the beginning oh. quote, you know, or maybe that period's not there, or even worse, there's two spaces after the period, and you got to catch that, you know. That's what your proofreader does. They go through and they find all these tiny little mistakes, and then they hand them over. And yes, there's a ton of other like editors you can get throughout that, um, but those are your basics um, that you're going to be looking for. And people do different jobs. There are different jobs for that. Most um, publishers will employ on some level a developmental developmental editor, which is going to be most likely your acquisitions editor, mm -hmm. who's picked you up, they've read it, and they're like, I really love the beginning, I really love this part, maybe this part needs to work. Mm -hmm. Let's work on that or something. Uh, then they'll actually have an editor who will go through it, because every house is going to go through the book, I'm sorry. They're not going to not put their fingers into it to make sure it's right, that there's something. And, it always blows my mind uh, when I was in publishing how many people thought their book was perfect. Mm. Oh, it just amazed me because I was like, this is amazing. Yeah, but yeah, and it's it's a thing, you know, your book's not perfect, I guarantee that. Even when it hits the shelf, I guarantee it's mm. not perfect. Brian, can I pause you for just a second? As, just as an example of what he's talking about, Stephen King, whether that you're a fan of him or not, he has gotten so popular that the editors don't want to touch him, and he's begged them to edit him because he knows he's not putting out perfect books. Nobody can do it. If he can't do it, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. I know I can't do it. Go ahead. Well, that was one of the problems with uh, the vanity publishers out there, the, the, yes. the yes. predators, uh, who will take a big chunk of money up front and then hand you a book. Um, one of the things they do is they sell you a really nice, expensive editing package. The problem is, is that they're a for-profit company, uh, and if they give you a bad edit, you might not want to publish the book with them, or you might not publish your next book with them. So they tell you they edit your book, and sure, they'll go through and find some commas you missed or something like that, but the reality is it's not an edit. It is a glorification of what you've written mm -hmm. um, to ensure that it goes out that way. So just be careful with that as some of the predators, too. And some of your editors are glorified English students who are just okay. So I always recommend getting a sample edit or something, mm -hmm. see right. edits that the editors have done if you're going to hire one, uh, and that'll pretty much keep you in... You know, good standings. Uh, I was going to add to line editing. Yeah. Uh, it is line by line, but line editing is also um, looking at dialogue. Yes. Trying to figure out if the tone's right, if the characterizations are right, um, you're wearing the same clothes in the right scenes. Um, I'm talking about continuity. I'm yeah, about you got to I mean, line editing is continuity. Yep. It's making sure characters' voices are the same. Um, it is picking up all your bad habits, yep. um, which I do too. I don't... I, Sometimes I'll suggest, this is the only time I will rewrite for you, and it's not really a rewrite, when I say, I know what you're trying to say, but maybe you, if you try this, and I give an example, mm -hmm. but I'm not saying, 
this is what you should do. I said, I think this is what you're trying to go for. But that, I mean, I just wanted to expand on why mm-hmm. editing, because it is continuity, and yeah. you want somebody to do that. That's yeah. a good option. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I am, because I, I've just had some wonderful work uh, with my editor on continuity, and, and, and it, it's whatever world you're creating, keep a Bible, and yes. make sure yes. your editor has access to that Bible. Now, my editing, my, my Bible, I actually put online. I built a wiki for my world oh, wow. that has That's every awesome. name, every person, place, strange word, uh, event that I think is important, a timeline, a calendar, all these fun stuff because the world building, that's a lot of what I'm doing. But it, one of the great things about this world building uh, of, of this wiki that has happened is that my editor and I have just, every time I, I toss something out, I can look back up the character, I can make sure you know that they still have dark hair or whatever, uh, but my editor can do the same things at the same time, and that has saved a ton of mistakes. Now, there have been some mistakes. We just realized that we made a mistake in the calendar and that when I was typing the calendar into my wiki, I had completely missed a month. I, 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 I had somehow or another cut out a line. Well, I fixed that. And, and you know, you, you were talking about, um, about fixing things as we go along. The drawback of being an indie author is I have fewer eyes looking over something. The advantage of being an indie author is, is that when I do find something, I can make those corrections a lot quicker. Uh, you talk about edits, versions of your books. I, I do edit and replace the versions of my books, the e-versions, consistently when I find a mistake. Because while it's not good to have mistakes, I've never read anything perfect. I'm not going to ever write anything perfect. If I find a mistake, I'm going to squash it as quickly as I can. And every time I get ready to order hard copies of my books, I do another full edit of the book to see that I haven't missed anything. And, and okay, now I've got a new hard copy, and it's as correct as I can make it. And that's the only way I can go through that process of squishing every possible error. You said story bible, and just real fast. Yes, we did do an episode sometime back. Now, season how long, one. Season one, it could be, yeah. Well, it could be season one uh, called Story Bibles. If Go look for that, please, anyway. But if you want a very fast look at one, go on Google and type in Battlestar Galactica Story Bible. They have a season one Story Bible out there, at least as of last time I looked, which was last month. It was still out there. You can download it, it's a PDF, and you can see what it is exa- as an example of what we're talking about. If you've never seen a story bible before, um, Anne McCaffrey kept a story bible yeah. for her Dragons of Pern. Unfortunately, sometimes she made mistakes with that story bible. But it's a great tool, both for editing and for your story craft, to have. So put that in your toolbox. And not just for fantasy. You don't do a story bible just oh, for yeah. fantasy. I no. don't. I don't write fantasy. Right. And I write down every character and how they're related to every other character and, and all the facts about them, so that I can go right yeah. back to it and get it right the first time. Exactly. Yeah. It's not just fantasy people. Very good. I'm glad. And Real quickly, do that while you're writing the book. Yes. Do not. Yes. Do not let it sit for three books and you go back through oh, and you God, spend no. months catching all of those things. I oh. copy and paste. So I copy yeah. and paste it right into another Word document, and that becomes my story Bible, so that I actually have the actual wording from the book that I, I have. I, I, I put that, that on my wiki, as a matter of yeah. fact, that I'll, I'll put that description into the wiki of, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. In addition, when you're doing the story Bible, I think it's very important when you have a new character or a new anything to write in the chapter and name of the book if it's a series it's Bible great. because you're going to wonder where the hell do I start with this thing. So put that in. Put in the definition information too. A good, a good piece of starts. Starts. Yeah, When you're three, four books in, that so, becomes... When did zero. I do that? Yeah, you yeah. need that. Our brains aren't that good, yeah. no matter how good you think you are. Um, a good piece of software that does this, I know I've mentioned before, I've had problems with the software, but not because of this, Scrivener. Scrivener is automatically has that built into itself if you choose to use it. But just FYI, that's a great piece of software to do that for you. I just wanted to say that there is one true way of writing, and it's whatever works for you. Yes. Scrivener did not work for me but only because I started building websites 
in 92. I started using Word in 90. Yeah. I know I can make websites and Word stand up and dance, and the, the, the learning curve of Scrivener, very powerful. I didn't want to spend the time doing that when I had the tools. Well, but what works for you... You can do everything Scrivener does in Word. Right, yes. You can just exactly. Word documents and story tree. Yeah, I do the same and, thing. And headings and all of these yeah. nice ways to, to manipulate the data. The thing that you have to remember about all of this, uh, the criticism, the, the only thing that you, you that really isn't just what works for you is that you're going to get have to get criticism and accept it and use it. If you ignore criticism, that way is not going to work for you. I, that's the one thing that I would say of, of methods, that if, if you ignore criticism routinely, uh, I think that's the only way you can really... You're in the wrong profession. You're yeah. in the wrong profession, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, I've um, been on, I'm sure we're all on Facebook uh, writing groups, but I've had writers go on and say, Can't, isn't there an editing program that can replace an editor? No. no. There is, and you know, people will be like, oh yeah, you don't need one, you can just go here, and I'm just like, oh, again, no. Um, and there are those writers, which I refuse to be to read for, who do, can't accept criticism and think everything they, they write is amazing. And then when they get the reviews of Goodreads, they're just crushed because they can't understand mm -hmm. what happened. And I'm, I'm telling all the writers out there, I mean, if you can't be critiqued, you're in the wrong business. Um, you can't walk around. We all have an ego. It's going to get bruised and you're going to be, you know, I was a journalism major, so I had the sort of ego beaten out of me early. Um, mm -hmm. But that's what happens when you're a writer. You're, you're going to get punched a lot and you have to, you have to accept that because you're not perfect and you do make mistakes and there are holes in your writing. The one thing to really kind of keep in mind when it comes to when it comes to um, getting sort of criticism from uh, from editors, it's a lot easier to heed those criticisms, those critiques, and make your book better and more universally appealing than it is to actually like fly around the world so you can look over the, over your sh the shoulder of every reader who is reading your book and say what I meant to say was this. You have to make sure that you know that everything that every page and every word that you're putting out there can be accessible to every, to as many people as possible. Otherwise, you might as well just like jot down something in a word document and send it to your closest friends because that's all the people that are gonna that are gonna actually read it. I think on that note, unless anyone has anything else to add, that was a great final word. So in that case. Thank you for listening, and tune in next week for yet another day. Me doing, me doing a porky pig. Editing. Editing. No, no, I it. Me doing a porky pig there. Um, no, tune in next week for yet another interesting tale in the writing industry. Thank you. Did you know that Write Pack Radio has an international audience? How would you like to reach that audience in regards to your books, your book services, your author services, or more? Go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com and look under advertising for more information. If you don't have a script, that's not a problem. We will be happy to work with you. Once again, go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com for more information. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.